And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Ramon Tashikori is the chair and Lowe's Distinguished Professor of the Department of Computer Science. He serves as the director of the NSF supported STEM grant and the ECRS scholarship program. His main area of research is in image processing, data science, visualization, and honeybee monitoring, monitoring systems. He has mentored many undergraduate and graduate students and has received close to 8 million in external funding to establish his research and scholarships at Appalachian State University. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Ramon Tashikori. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here. Of course, uh, you know, besides dealing with the regular daily problems in computer science and, uh, and of course, five weeks into the semester, I'd love to be here and share some of the things that we have done with uh, in our Honeybee project. Thanks again for the invitation. I'm very delighted to be here. So talking about some computing tools that we use for Honeybee monitoring system and share the Beamon project and the AppMace project that was recently funded by the, uh, the North Carolina Office of President. So motivation is that the, the honeybee is always uh, among the best pollinators. When we come to our, our agriculture, they've uh, helped the flowers uh, fidelity because once they find the resource, they go back to it and they let their basically system to go back to it in a large number. About one third of our food comes from the honeybees, which is about 235 to $577 billion per year of revenue. In recent years, we have lost about 50% of the uh, bees because of different reasons. And they still, uh, we are studying the, the cause of those. Collectively, they used to be referred to as colony collapse disorder. In our region, the main cause of problem is uh, varroa mites. But um, so we are trying to kind of address the issue. Of course, uh, since uh, the motivation for our research project was that because the honeybees start from their hives and they go for foraging and get water and nectar and pollen, and they die usually outside the system. They keep the system inside very clean. And we know that the, the queen lay eggs, you know, every day in large number, between 800 to 4,000 sometimes eggs are laid in one day, depends on the peak of the season. And so we know we lose some bees outside the hive. Control, uh, looking at the traffic in uh, incoming and outgoing traffic to the hive is a great indication indicator of the health of that hive. So that was the main reason we started this project. We all wanted to see whether we can have actually a pattern in the traffic behavior inside and outside the hive. So of course, we wanted to rely on technology and automate this uh, traffic, basically, estimation. So that's why we, we got involved with this project. Main, the start was to get technology and use image processing at first. And then, the, of course, the, the system would allow us to learn about the health of the hive if we could determine how the a good, healthy hive is, looks like and, and um, how you know, a disease hive actually an healthy hive looks like. So that's the main reason, that's the main motivation behind this project. So, so many students are involved and so, several other faculty. Just to give you a quick overview, uh, there are three types of bees, three types of roles in a hive. Uh, there is one queen that lays eggs and control the whole ecosystem in, uh, of a hive. There are about two to 3% drones that are all male. Their purpose is actually to spread the gene of the hive. So basically their work is to mate with, uh, with queens. And, they, and then of course, the majority of the bees are worker bees, which take care of all day-to-day -day activities of bees, including um, bringing pollen, water, nectar, uh, clean, actually cleaning the hive, and uh, hygienic stuff, a lot of hygienic work, and then feeding the queen and the work, uh, the, the babies and the drone them itself. So honeybee facts uh, to our project, we know that the, the queen on average lays about 600 to 1500 eggs. So they live about three to four years of lifetime, a healthy queen, a strong queen. 
and then we we need to maintain the temper the actually the good colony strong colony core the temperature of the hive is about 92 93 degree that they do it by rolling around and keep the population at the center and then we know that when they reach the 40,000 to 60,000 naturally if there is a resource available they split that's the, what we call it uh, um, swarming and we know that honey has about 80% uh, sugar and about a, a little less than 20%, usually about 18% water. And that's very important too, because what we call fanning in a hive, that the bees in front of the hive start fanning, rolling their wings to circulate air, is the purpose of removing actually water from the, the nectar. So that's also important to us. And then, uh, and, and of course, once the honey has 18% or lower per, uh, uh, water content, they cap the, the cell and keep them for the winter. That's also important. And we also know that the bees communicate with each other. They, they alarm each other by making noise through wings. They also communicate with each, each, each other, what we call dancing. Okay, so those are all important. Traditionally, the beekeepers would open a hive and then would look inside the hive like this, uh, you can see in the picture, to see how the development of a hive is. This causes stress, introduces external things into the hive and really is not, um, and definitely stresses the queen and the bees all together because they get, they get aggressive and sometimes you know, they, they attack the, the beekeeper. So we wanted to reduce that stress and also have a way to kind of do it automatically using technology. So when we, visit, when we physically open a hive, we look at it, we want to see how the, whether the, there is enough pollen, whether there's enough kind of comb, uh, capped cells, whether there's enough uh, brood, the brood pattern is good, whether there is um, the worker bees actually doing their job by cleaning and feeding the, the larvas. We also want to see how the smell of the hive looks like. Do you, do you smell like uh, the hive actually has the smell of a dead bees? Because that's, all, that's very bad. Uh, so we want to look at all those things. And, and it, if you have a large number of bee uh, hives, that causes a problem. So the Beemon was uh, created to address that and as a way to automatically monitor the hive. We thought we use computer, computing tools, embedded systems, image processing, signal processing, neural network, machine learning, internet, internet, internet of things platform, and a great deal of programming to do just that, to see if we can automate the monitoring. So the goal was to have a non-invasive, inexpensive, durable, and uh, modular system that we can move it to the hive. You can see on, on the picture I'll show you the, the, how the, the, the system looks like. And so reliability of the system and cost was very important to us. So we, it took us six years to actually uh, fine tune the system to the point that now we are confident that it, wo it will work reliably. So this is the system 11B in front of the hive. You can see the wires coming at the bottom, uh, at the entrance, you can see that from the top, a camera pointing to the entrance there are wires on the right that goes to the temperature and humidity sensor, and, on, and one goes to the microphone. And on the left, uh, so you also see the internet uh, connection. You can see actually the beam on in action. Let me stop sharing and take you to another screen. So you can see beam on in action. This is beam on in action right now, what we call near live uh, from, the, from uh, our house from the two of the hives. So bees coming and going, we have an opportunity to annotate. For example, this is a medium traffic and I see the pollen coming in. You can see the bees bringing some pollen on their leg. Um, so you can see that and then a white pollen, yellow pollen. So I'm gonna mark it as pollen at this late in the season, I don't see any drones. So, but you can see that this, this is a very healthy hive from the indication that you see a good number of bees coming in. As I say, if you pay attention, you can see a good number of um, pollen, bees coming with pollen. And of course, being in uh, goldenrod, a majority of the pollen that coming in is dark, uh, dark gold. So going back to the slides again, 
so this was uh, actually just a view of, uh, uh, am I back on the slides, Paul? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, so, so that, that gadget in front of the hive is uh, recording all of these things. And then, and then we bring it to our server and we start analyzing. So we listen to the audios and then we watch the videos through different tools. So this is the beam on system. So this beam on system, you can see that the hives are lined up, the, the monitoring system gets in front, then we do the internet connection, we have an IoT, what inter, internet of thing platform that manages the data in and out. And then on the side, we do image processing, signal processing, AI. And, and so the new project that just got funded, App Maze, I don't have many slides, but let me show you how it looks. So we combine and we extended the beam on App Maze, actually have a yard. It's a big data project, bring the data in. Um, by the way, thanks uh, to the Office of Research for helping get that proposal out. And uh, you know, I'm glad that it was selected from our campus. So, uh, and the project just started. So it's a great thing for our campus and uh, thanks for the support. Uh, so the big data comes in. We have, uh, we have uh, several in this uh, uh, process, we have audio recording, video recording. And then for the first time now we are doing genetic studies. So the genetic study is critically important because we think that the more diverse the bees are, the chance of survival is higher. We have some uh, evidence of that. We want to prove it now. It's a hypothesis that hopefully by the end of third year, we have shown, and then we have a large amount of data for scientists to get in and uh, study the data that we produce as a hub in North Carolina and actually will be the first to do this. So we will be a hub to, uh, for many scientists across the world. So the BMON actually is written in Python. And, and so we do audio recording, video recording, humidity, weight, and almost near time video that I just showed you with one minute delay. I'm gonna just show you an overview of the machine learning process. You can see this is the detection of bees that we use for the traffic analysis, the beehive on the top right brings the data into the server that we have. And then we do a lot of image processing to do the background subtractions. We do object detection. In our case, objects are leaves, bees, other insects, but we wanna make sure that we count the, the actual thing, which are the bees. So we do optical flow and a couple of filtering. And this is what we get. In front of a hive, you see the bees coming in, we mark them. And then if there are uh, the, 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 the square, actually what we call blob detection. This blob detection goes to a motion detection that we detect the, the blob. If they move, we can count them as bees. And then we, the question is whether these bees are coming in and out. So we set up different boundaries in front of the hive. You can see the square boundary here, rectangular boundaries here, and there we are. We count the bees. The, 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 we do the analysis of the traffic. And here is a pre, uh, on the right hand side of this picture, you see a graph that produced that shows the traffic in and out of a hive. And this hive happened to be uh, a hive that got robbed. How did we find out this hive was in tr trouble? Because when we put the bees inside the hive at the beginning, they, the, the uh, queen started laying eggs within couple of days, it takes 20 to 22 days for the eggs to start hatching. But the current bees live only about 20, uh, about 40 days, so they die. So we, we expect that we have a start high, the number of bees goes down until the new bees start hatching, then the number goes up to a peak, which is about 40 to 60,000 bees, depends on the size of the hive. And then they slowly come down to a plateau and then go to the winter sleep. If the you can see here in this picture that there was a sharp drop almost close to zero. That was a bad sign. That means the, the, we, they got to a peak here, um, but this drop was too sharp. And then suddenly we saw a peak right here. This peak actually was due to a robbery by the neighboring bees. You can see them both in the rectangle and uh, triangle boundaries that this peak is right actually where the a robbery had happened. As a result of robbery, the bees from the neighboring uh, heart come and steal all the honey and nectars, and then basically destroy the hive that actually got robbed. So we, we want to actually prevent that. 
we want to prevent and, and, and uh, some of the prevention can come from detecting the fights. So you can see in this picture, uh, the, the, the plot is the plot of that hives that kind of got robbed. This drop was unacceptable. This peak shows the robbery. And then we have to go look at the images a few days before and start detecting the fights in front of the hive. So detecting the fight is a good sign that the, the bee, uh, a hive is getting robbed. And we also see that some birds come and start picking drones because the defense mechanism is very weak. So we actually has, have been able to detect the bird flying in front of the hive using the audio. So this is in general a natural behavior of the hive at the beginning, but the peaks that happening at the end is unusual. So, we, we, so when the peak happened that way, we know that something else is going on. I don't have time to show the videos, but uh, uh, you saw a live video and you can see the, these videos correspond to different robberies. This is the result of a robbery. You can see that they destroy the whole hive. They remove everything and they kill all the bees inside the hive that, uh, that remain. And it is really a disaster, devastating result. And of course, naturally the, the hive that uh, stole all this thing is stronger. So to summarize, we have been relying on audio, which is the, the normal frequency of the hive. And then we have been detecting some hissing and some other frequency or like piping to, uh, to distinguish normal and abnormal behavior. So the audio analysis has helped us already detect some abnormalities, like for example, this blue uh, image here, blue signal here is belong to a, uh, a, uh, a bumblebee getting into a hive. So we can detect those anomalies and we abnormalities. And, and then at the bottom, you see one, high, one bee is very close to the microphone. So, and these are all normal. So this is a normal audio of belong to the bees. This is a bee that is too close to the microphone and the blue one is belong to, for example, a bumblebee. We also have detected birds and other things. So we hope to expand on this. In this picture, you see, for example, the normal behavior of the bees at the bottom, then a truck passing by. So, so we, have been, we have been successfully separating this using some of the computing tools we call in machine learning, we call BFON. It's a collective tool that we have been able to detect. And, um, and these two peaks that I mark with the arrow correspond to the amount of noise during a robbery. So we are able to do those kind of things. So to summarize, I know my time is up. To summarize, we have been able to use the audio, video, for sure. And then we're hoping to add humidity, temperature, and also the weight um, uh, so that we can actually automatically uh, watch 30 hives and then collect a big data for people to analyze and also do the analysis ourselves. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop here because the, the 19, but I just wanna show you some of the things before I do that. So. One of the projects we are doing is separating drones from worker bees. A number of drones also a good indication of the health of a hive. If we have too many drones, that's alarming because uh, genetically we have a problem. So we are doing a tool to count the number of drones and worker bees. We have a, a IoT things board that actually shows the, the, the uh, live uh, humidity, temperature, and counting. We also do text mining of the text that people put in uh, when we, they watch a video. And so all these things hopefully will come together in a big, big machine learning uh, project. And within three years, we all celebrate the outcome with of including also the genetic data, which we don't have right now. Okay, so human being cause problem for the bees by building and removing resources from them, using pesticides and electronics and so many different things. And now we need to help them. And to help them, we need collectively to come together and having a competing, uh, so competing tools to uh, monitor and, and let, get over these uh, adversities is critical. So, and that's what the, pro the idea of BMON and app-based project is. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, 
um, Dr. Hamza, Dr. Perry, Dr. Wilkes, who have been directly involved with the project. So many students, you can find their names and their research papers and presentations on our BMON project. And of course, also a sponsored program for helping us getting together. And before Paul moves to the Office of Sponsor Program was office manager here and helping us putting a lot of orders to get things going. Thank you all very much. Any questions? So, Thank you, uh, Dr. Tashikoy, for an informative and very interesting presentation. Uh, I'd like to open it up for questions now. If you, have, if you would like to ask a question, please type your question in the Q&A or chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and hit send. And we do have one doc, uh, question so far, Dr. Tasha Corey. Uh, are the varroa mites something that affects bees everywhere or just in the North Carolina area? This is an excellent question. Actually, it affects everywhere that they practice modern beekeeping. It's very interesting that by we, when, we, when we commercialize beekeeping and created these hives that they and forced the bee to become bigger, and created bigger cell for the for both to keep more honey and also to keep their larvae might start actually putting more more eggs in those cells. So the bigger the cell, in fact, the own cells are having the larger number of eggs. So then the the natural bees they don't have a big enough cells for the varroa to get around, and they have very few varroa mites in there. So. It is an, it's an international problem across the world. And the more commercialized they have become, the more problem that we have introduced because this, the cells that we collect honey and also be used to lay eggs in them are bigger. And therefore, where I can get in there and lay a couple of eggs, some, some cells more than one egg. So national, international problem across the world, global problem. So Thank you, Dr. Tashkori. Uh, next question. When bees take over and destroy a beehive, where do they take the honey? Very good question. They don't take the pollen. They only take the nectar and honey back to their, their, uh, their hive. And it's already low percentage water. So immediately they cap it and they restore it and they, they use it for the winter use. Great. Um, are there any IT limitations you're having with your current way of monitor monitoring the hives? Very good question. I love that question, Tom. Of course, I'm, I'm calling you after this talk to get help. So we are placing hives all over the place. I think we're going to put five locations on campus based on the agreement that we had, uh, based on the initial visit we had with Lee Ball, maybe two at the State Farm. Um, these hives have to be connected with internet cable because video is a problem. Uh, we have tried several different ways to do uh, wireless. Unfortunately, when it comes to the video, especially when we have large traffic, the video file become big, and we will have a we have we have had problem transmitting the video files to our server. So yes, there is a limitation, and we need really to have a wire connected internet to these hives. So that's why the hives are usually not too far from the buildings that they provide us access to internet. At my house is about 40 feet away. They don't bother anyone, but I use a cable from our uh, internet uh, router and these are uploads. So they don't compete with the Netflix and other things and uh, my, make sure my soccer game watching up at all. So yes. So there is a limitation with the faster, the better. And in fact, we can improve the resolution of the videos if we have faster internet. Yeah, let me know when you want to talk. Absolutely. You sounds get, good. I, I, I want to have two at your house too. That'd be great. Um, next question is when hives are robbed, are there any specific strategies to attempt to restore them or is it better to relocate? Very good question. So, Sarah, that's a very good question. Uh, so last year we got robbed and I moved the, so we, I had moved to a new house. I moved the hive back to my old neighborhood with, the, with the, my old neighbor that, uh, you know, in, uh, so they kept them for about a month. Uh, they say if you move it within two miles, the other bees stop kind of attacking them. 
uh, and some people actually cover the whole, they put some sh sugar syrup and they cover the whole hive. Those strategies don't work. No, because as soon as the bee comes out, once the neighboring hive detect that the, there is a weak uh, defense mechanism, they go for it. It's just like uh, the, the way that they survive in nature. But the, when we moved the hive further away, that was about five miles away, that worked. And that actually hive, um, you know, regain, and we requeen also the thing so that they make sure they have a strong queen. But uh, definitely we moved it out. That's the only strategy I know that it works. Covering it, it doesn't work. It may work for a few days. Again, another hive will find them weak and they start attacking them. So that's the strategy I would perhaps suggest moving the hive, you know, five, six miles away because bees actually find uh, go to up to four miles. And of course, honey is a free honey already processed. They love it. So um, I, yeah, I would move it beyond four miles. Um, how many hives are you currently monitor monitoring? The, 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 if you go to the beam on and click on the stream, you see two hives we call R541 or R542. These numbering will change to a, app mace one through 30, hopefully starting March. But right now we have R541 and 42. These are uh, uh, right now on live basically system. So these are the, the, the source for current data. Uh, have you and other scientists been able to make any progress on determining what the cause of the honeybee decline is? What what's causing it? So um, I don't know. I don't know what to, how to answer this, Paul. But varroa mites and other causes like insects and and uh, lack of resources and cold, of course, they are list of things that cause major problem for bees. I personally believe that, which, which is the opinion that some, some people don't like, is that we, into, we are introducing, genetically we're introducing bees that are not ready and they don't have enough diversity to survive adversity. And that's really what the reason we have now uh, an expert, genetic expert on our team to kind of help us determine how diverse our bees are. Because I feel that the bees that we buy through packages, they don't have diversity. They're good in one thing, basically bringing nectar and producing honey, but not defending themselves against adversities, which is cold and also mites. So I know perhaps, uh, you know, not everybody like what I say because bee industry is big. But that's my opinion, of course, yeah. at the moment. So you would say over commercialization, corporate? Over commercialization, one, because honey, honey is a little bit honey for themselves to survive the winter. They never was, were created to produce 80 to 100 pounds of honey. Yeah. And we are picking just about 80 pounds of honey from every hive every year. Right. And because but we made the cells bigger so they can hold more, more honey in there, we also, when we, the bee, lay eggs in these big cells, larva can get in there and lay a couple of eggs. Africans, African uh, uh, combs, honeybee combs are very tiny, you know, and the bees are much th uh, thinner. So the cells are thinner and varroa mites even if they can't get the chance to actually go lay eggs there. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I believe that's all the questions we have. Um, and I'd like to thank Dr. Tasha Corey, our presenter, for offering the sessions for, for the research and creative activity at Appalachian Event 2021. Uh, don't forget to visit the event website to view other available sessions, research posters, and recordings. Um, Lauren and her team will be posting a recording of this presentation if you'd like to share it with your friends or, or colleagues. And uh, I'd like to thank our audience as well for those wonderful questions. And uh, we will uh, 
in this. Uh, Dr. Tashikori's got some information here if you'd like to reach out to him. And uh, please let, um, let us know if, if, um, if you have any other questions that you think of later. Thank you very much, everyone. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Dr. Tashikori.